Well, welcome everybody to another edition of Taking Stock Live, where we do just that. We'll take stock with people and inspirational figures for me, for all of us at Microsoft, and really our customers around the globe on what's happening out there. And I have to tell you, today is a very special day because I feel like I'm sharing someone with you that has been pivotal in my entire life in every single way. Many of you will know that I have a personal and professional board of directors, which has been really the people that I've gone to when I've had the hardest decisions or have told me the been the truth serum for me in my life. And the person who you're going to meet today is, I think, maybe one of the executive chairs, if she'd want to be that, of uh, my personal board of directors, and that is Eva Archer-Smith. Eva is a very special guest. She is an incredible person. She has been on my own personal and professional journey. And um, she's an executive coach to many people all around the world, particularly, I think, uh, women who, who are working through leading large teams globally. We realized by getting ready for all of you today that we have known each other for 16 years. Um, <laughs> we both look pretty good, don't we? <laughs> it's been a while and so we much has changed at the we time were 20 when we started that's right yeah. um i met eva when she was my executive coach at gap inc i was sort of newly in position and so it's just an incredible privilege to welcome you today eva archer smith executive coach Kelly, it is so, always great to talk to you, and and to talk to you in this venue is really quite exciting for me, and is so, I believe, uh, representative of really how you have grown to have a platform of enormous influence and for good. So I'm so happy to be here. Well, I thank you, and I I know I would not be able to accomplish two percent of what I've accomplished without you. So. Let's let's start. Well, it'll take us both way back, but you in particular. I started off these uh, podcasts, webcasts, by asking our guests what was their first job in retail. And honestly, though I know so much about you, I don't know if that even applies to you. But did you start? Where did maybe what was your first job and was that retail? Yeah, you know, I I think I know that you have a lot of guests who actually can say that their first job was in retail. And I think that would be a great first job. I'm going to tell you about my first job, but it was not in retail. I've never worked in retail. But when I was uh, thinking about that, I'd like to say that I am um, expert at the other side of retail. And so <laughs> I have, you know, I am a shopper and I have a little plaque that somebody gave me that says I have an advanced degree in jewelry acquisition, for example. And I love to shop whenever I travel. And it's not just about sort of buying. It literally is shopping. I just think that uh, cultures and cities and neighborhoods, that what what they're trading is such an indication of who they are and the kinds of people they're reaching. And so I am a big shopper, um, but never worked in retail. What was your first job, Eva? So, I don't actually know. You know, yeah. you know. It's interesting. And I'd like to tell you in the context of a experience that I just had. Um, so my first job, and I, I have worked since I was 15. And my parents used to drive me down to the little brick building where the Hartford Democrat, which was a weekly newspaper in my little hometown, was my first job. It was how I got through college. Uh, I worked there all summer and I have always wanted to be a reporter. And so I had an early career as a journalist. Now at 15, that wouldn't be a fair uh, term to use journalist, I had to go, but, but the lessons I learned, I had to go and sit through city council meetings. And I was not only the youngest, but the only woman. And they did the meeting that was there. And then they went to the bar, all the guys and had the other really meeting. And I missed that. But then I would come back and type on a manual typewriter, everything that had happened in the meeting. But here's what's occurred to me recently. Um, and then later, by the way, I worked, I was a reporter for the Milwaukee Journal. So I actually did more legitimate um, 
newspaper work. But when I was there particularly, now this is the mid 60s, I was in high school and then I came back every summer after university. But I remember that anything that needed to be done, I volunteered for. So this was not only pre-computer, but literally they were handsetting type. So when they needed somebody to handset the ads, I'd say, I'd like to learn how to do that. And then when the guy who did the obituaries was sick, I said, I'd like to do that. So this older woman took me aside and she said, Eva, you cannot do that. That if you keep volunteering to learn new things, they're going to expect you to do more. And that's not how this works. And I guess she was the early vintage of quiet quitting. Like, don't do anything more than what they're paying you for. And I remember thinking that that was such, that was my first professional piece of advice that I was given. Now, I want to fast forward almost 60 years to an experience I had last week in Cairo, Egypt. And I was working with a large, I was there for two weeks doing several workshops and working with the, the, the local unit there, but also all the corporate leaders who had flown in. And this particular night, uh, the new leader, just a brilliant young man from Italy, was there to give the kind of rah-rah speech. And here's the, here is the advice he gave these young employees. He said, if you see a gap, lean in. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about whether it's in your job description and not from a place of territory or power or control, but fill the gap, lean in where there's a vacuum, fill it. And then he said, I learned that from my coach, who was me. And how different that piece of advice is. And, and Shelley, you and I have talked about that a hundred times mm -hmm. and about if you can contribute, contribute, lean in. At the gap. And I just had to laugh because it was such an opposite of the kind of advice that I got on my first job, which I didn't pay attention to, fortunately. Yeah, fortunately. I mean, I think that's so instructive. First off, I'm not, at all, I didn't know, but I'm not at all surprised that you started off as a, a journalist because I think you're by nature part of the what you do with all of us is you ask great questions. Thank you. Yeah. And you're curious. But two, to your point, I think so often we wait for the job description or as you've counseled me, like an organizational redesign, but that's not what fixes things. Just jump in and do it. Look at the prop, study the problem and jump in even before you're asked to, to try, try to help solve. And that's truer now than ever. I mean, you know, organizations, that does come from the same same root word as organism. I mean, we are a living, breathing thing, and we've tried to put these sort of arbitrary um, uh, edifices on those, and the org chart is a good one, and I understand why we need them and, and all of that. We need some order in the chaos, but um, it, it's really uh, better as... It, with life to kind of go with the flow. So, so just I think Eva, you're right in terms of organism and organizations, and you've worked in and around many large corporations, and you were in public affairs at Continental Airlines. So, you know, maybe what what have you learned about these big corporations, or any fun stories and lessons learned? Well, you know, it's interesting. The reason I became a journalist is that I I wanted, I always have been interested in people connecting with each other. In fact, recently I had to clean out my mother's home and um, look through all of the old picture volumes. And, and one of the things that I noticed is that as a little girl, my head was always sort of cocked like this in all the pictures. I don't think it was a, a neck issue. I think I was always trying to figure out what was going on. And it's funny now because I have a little Cavachon puppy because that's that little dog that looks like that all the time. And so I've always sort of trying to see what fits. And um, I didn't know when I went to university, I thought just that it was going to be I was going to be a newspaper reporter. And, a, and, and then I really sort of loved business. And so I began to see that there were these roles where you could try to communicate. So when I was at Exxon, for instance, I my job was always kind of on the fringes. It was like, can you figure out a way to talk to the Sierra Club? And can you figure out a way to talk to people who who 
think differently about things. Um, I think what's really interesting, I, I thought I've been thinking a little bit about um, these last two international trips that I've taken, if it's okay to talk about those. So Shelly, as you well know, um, I'm on a six month sabbatical and uh, I, I often ask myself, so how that how's that going? Because <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it's quite a sabbatical. You just said you got back from two international yes. trips. So yes. anyway, keep keep on. <laughs> exactly. You know, I um, you know I'm I'm uh, in my seventh generation, and so I've said that um, I was working so hard and really didn't have much free time. So I said, okay, I'm going to take a six month sabbatical, and I'm going to try to think about whether I'd be interested in retiring. So what I found out is the answer is no, no, I wouldn't be interested in retiring. I am very interested in not being so busy. So I'm, I'm kind of working that out. But uh, when I took this sabbatical, uh, I got invitations to go and spend a couple of weeks first in Paris um, and uh, then in uh, Cairo because you know, people are back and people are back and people are flying in and there's meetings and I, I've done everything virtually like most of us for a couple of years. Um, and so I feel like two things. One is that I've really begun to, to notice what it looks like now that we're all back together and how have people changed. And secondly, because I'm doing this sort of episodically in the middle of my sabbatical, the cadence of the work is much different than I've ever done it. And what is happening is that I'm actually finding myself following the advice that I give all of my clients, in, including you, which is take time to reflect. Now, the what really happens is we rarely do. I mean, we can hardly keep up with the new things. And, and I have been, because I've had these sort of hunks of work and then not a client base to fill in, that I've been able to do, think, do, think. And I am sort of, I am like, I don't even know what the word is. Like I am just obsessed with trying to encourage my clients to do that more. You know, we're learning a lot about reflection. We're learning about that um, experience is a good teacher. There's a recent study done by Harvard Business Review and its sister school in Paris, HEC, who have studied longitudinally, you know, what is the best teacher and sure, it, you know, experience is a good teacher. It's probably only a good teacher if you're doing what you've done before. But what they have found is that if we stop and think about what we've just done and what we learn from it, that our individual performance level goes up about 18%. And if we share that with others, that the group's performance goes up about 25%. So I want to share. So that's just a, sort of a personal story. And I want to share what I've been seeing. Two things. One is it's getting harder. It is getting harder. Um, we've talked about change and the rate of change and for decades, but I mean, that was like kindergarten compared to what we're seeing now. It's getting harder and we're making it harder. I think we're making it harder. And I want to talk specifically about what seems very, very clear to me in terms of two of the essential competencies that leaders need today that we've overcomplicated. Now, I'm not saying anything is simple, but there are some things that are simple, not easy. Um, two of the competencies that I think are essential to keep our head above water and our eyes on the goal are political savvy and empathy, right? So political savvy, you know, I cannot tell you how many people say, oh, I hate politics. Well, you know, they live in a cave. I want to say live in a cave. You know, politics comes from the root word polity uh, that means how do you get along with people? And in fact, the definition of political savvy, the last little phrase is, are you maze bright? So all politics means, do you know how to navigate the terrain in order to get something done? And so I understand when people say I don't like politics, they're talking about some sort of, you know, backstreet on back, you know, uh, closed door unfair things. But, you know, 
that's not what I'm talking about. You know, you have to be maze bright, politically savvy. The other thing is that you have to be an empathetic leader. You have to know how to motivate and inspire and develop your people. I think, and this might be my journalistic uh, training, we have complicated those two competencies to think that we have to have some sort of um, Jedi mind melt, uh, psychic ability, right? So that people like to say, to demonstrate their political savvy, oh, I know what they're going to say, or I know how to get to these people, as if we ha should, or even could, if we should, ascertain what other people's motives are. And the key is, the way to know that is to ask people. Mm -hmm. You know, the skills are ask and listen. Mm -hmm. Ask and listen. And I think that sounds too simple for people. So so in our effort to be brilliant, we think we've become, you know, Dr. Phil. <laughs> That we have to be so psychic and I, oh, I know exactly why they're doing that and this is what it's going And then I'll talk to those people and I'll say, is that why you're doing that? And they'll say, no, no, not at all. And, and it matters what people's motivations are and it matters what people want and it matters what motivates people. But they're the only experts on that. And, and if we spent less time trying to decipher that. And I see that both in the idea of empathy and in the idea of political savvy. And so I've been working lately with teams, just making them listen to each other, yeah. making them. And, you know, we've done this with your team. W what do you want me to know about the job you're doing? What is your greatest challenge? What would be the thing I could do that could help you the most? And I think it's this desire to be smart that has made us, a, you know, it takes a lot of humility to ask questions, to say, you know, I don't know exactly what you mean. I learned this in, uh, before I became a coach, I had a market research company. And I did qualitative research where I would go into my customers' clients and talk to them about why they made decisions. And I was very conscious of how vulnerable I had to be and how tempting it was for me to say, oh, yeah, I know exactly. Oh, yeah, I know exactly right. what you and instead, I had to sort of double click and say, well, what do you mean by productivity? And I even had people say to me, well, did you really not know the definition of that word? And I, you know, and boy, you know, that's like, you know, ego damaging. And I would come back and I would say, no, 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 I, I do know my definition, but I want to hear your definition. And I think if we just spent more time asking each other what was going on. And how do we fit together? And then really listening to what they say, that um, things would be better. And by the way, all of that is very consistent with what we're learning about new brain research and mm -hmm. how it is those behaviors around a common aspiration that brings us to our prefrontal cortex where we're producing oxytocin. So it is just this sort of I have just seen so intensely over the last two months this 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 haze that we've like a web that we've gotten ourselves in that if we could just clear it out, we could really get to the heart of the matter. So I, I just wanted to share that a little bit. I love that, Eva. And I think particularly in terms of the world that we're living in right now, um, you know, I sometimes, and I see this with myself needing to show up and have the answers. I had a major cosmetics company executives in just last week in our executive briefing center. And I was sort of, as I'm often called to do, going through the trends of what we're seeing. Yeah. But I, but I, I wasn't in the room physically with them. So I stopped and said, you know, is this what, which you've coached me on? Like, do you see what I see? What do you see that I don't see? Perfect. And, um, you know, I didn't I hadn't talked at that point yet about, you know, cybersecurity threats because, you know, it was, if, it was in and, and they said, well, you're not actually talking about cybersecurity. And I said, oh, wow, you are right. Yeah. And yeah. That you're and I'm hearing that. 
And yeah. even my, the, the, the world is changing so quickly that my, I haven't updated my slides, even though I work for Microsoft. Yeah. And it, uh, he said, well, let's talk about that. And would you come see us and we could talk more about it. Yeah. And so I didn't have to be the, it sort of goes from the learn it all to the know it all. Like I didn't have to know it, yes. but, um, but you know, your, your call out on just, you know, political savvy and empathy, yeah. like th those bring those, those traits to bear. Right, right. And that that it is, um, like I say, is simple but not easy. And it's because yeah. we're unlearning so many things. You know, the thing we always have to remember um, is, and I, this is particularly true when I'm working with emerging leaders who sort of uh, spent more of their life in school than in work. Now, we're, we're both at a place where we finally are spending more time <laughs> work than we did in school. Yeah. But school is all about having the answers and singular um, honor. Then work is exactly the opposite. But but we we don't know that. And so we walk in with all these habits. And, you know, I I think we really do have to be generous with ourselves, too. I mean, I had an experience recently. I mean, you've heard me t tell this story um Shelly, that when I was like eight, my family would get two magazines delivered. I, I was a part of a military family, so we moved all the time. And so one of the consistencies is that we got these two magazines delivered, which I thought was just unbelievable. I mean, this was, you know, way before all the things that we have now. And one of them was the Reader's Digest. And I remember as an eight-year-old sort of reading one of those little vignettes about um, someone who had been walking um, on a country road and saw in the distance uh, a farmer sitting on a box hoeing. And that in that moment, the, um, the, the person writing the story just said, you know, this was the most uh, ha awful example of laziness and, you know, um, sloth that they had ever seen. And then they walked around the bin and looked back over and saw that the farmer had no legs. And in that instant, that one perception was radically changed into a different perception. And I use that story to talk about see seeming to know, even as a young person, that how you looked at things mattered. And so I have tried to spend my life having a broader perspective. But can I tell you that it wasn't just a week ago that um, I was at a do our dog park. So I'll tell you this quick story, but it's okay. just telling it on me. I was at the dog park and with my little canvas on, <laughs> with his head tilted. And there was um, somebody I didn't know, an older gentleman, and he was walking this bigger dog. And the dog went to a place and did his business. And they're really strict about like bags everywhere and pick up your dog's business. And instead, this guy went and, and got a stick and put it sort of near where this mess was and then walked away. And I remember thinking, well, that's kind of against the rules. You know, that's not, so yes. that's not the way it's it is. To be. <laughs> and, um, you know, I kind of, I rolled my eyes and um, then somebody who was there who knew the guy said, oh, he does that. And then his wife comes later in the evening and picks it up. Ooh. And uh, I like my heckles going. <laughs> oh, Shelly, Shelly, we both did. See, yeah. immediately it was like, what? What? And of course, just instantly, all of the judgment and condemnation and, you know, who was I mad or at him or her and everything. Right. Well, sure enough, a couple days later, I saw the same thing happen. And fortunately, there was somebody um, you know, instead of saying, I wonder why she does that, which is always the thing to do, this person next to me uh, who was in the park on the bench with me said, oh, you know, Jack has had very, very serious back surgery. He can't bend over, but he loves his dog and he loves taking him to the dog park. And his wife says, Jack, go do it, honey. Take the dog. Just mark where it is and I'll go back and pick up the mess. Wow. Now, in that moment, first of all, another example of just looking at something a different way, but mostly for me saying, Eva, yeah. you know, you teach this stuff. Right. But our so so the the journey is 
always to, to celebrate the humanity that is us and also to work off some of the rough edges. Completely. You know, some of the- really. And to, as you often do with me, ask why, you know, yeah. like get, the, the get into the get into the curious place in, yes. instead of the knowing place. And that's exactly. so. So let's talk about that a little bit, because I think for so many people out there and me sitting here with you right now, sort of the transition you made from corporate marketing mm-hmm. communications to becoming an executive coach. I, I know you didn't do just a, you know, woke up one morning and say, I feel like doing this. Why did you make that transition? And what's that, what's it been like to, to be on the other side of, of this whole um, gig, I guess I will say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because now that I'm thinking about a little bit of a slower pace, I'm reading all these books about rewiring and it all says try to figure out what your passion is what and i think i'm actually doing that i'm actually doing that i mean i i have found in this work what joseph campbell calls your bliss i think what's interesting though is the journey that got me here right and so um i and i think what i would say to everybody is really just to sort of walk through life open-hearted and open-armed <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, to, to like I say, to go with the flow. So I was liking what I was doing in a, a corporate life. So I, I did, I worked uh, for Exxon and in the work that I had mentioned, trying to form alliances with people who are not natural allies. And then went, uh, I live in Houston, Texas, and Continental Airlines was headquartered here, and they were buying uh, Eastern Airlines, and I went to work as their head of communications and marketing. And I love that. I love that. I just realized that I was not a corporate type. I mean, I think mm-hmm. there are some people who, um, and I think lives are great in the corporate environment, the huge impact. Um, I I. I felt that I was sort of more entrepreneurial. So I went out on my own and I started this research company and just getting paid to be curious with people. And then I was just a mirror, which is a lot what a coach is too. I would listen to my clients, customers, and I would come back and I would say, you know, this is what they're saying and this is what they want. And, and, and they, they are kind of curious about why you won't do that. And so, um, in 1999, and I remember it because I was working on this whole slew of what they were calling Y2K programs. You know, everybody thought the world would end when the year 2000 came. And I was working with a, um, a, a company in, in um, Great Britain who, who was, they, they called an ERP. These were these software people who were getting everybody ready for Y2K. And I was just jet lagged enough. I was making my presentation. I was just jet lagged enough that, you know, I don't know, it was before you're so zoned out, you're not comprehending, but, but there's no facade anymore. So I'd given my presentation and said, this is what, um, you know, your clients want, what your customers are looking for. And then this kind of young president uh, stood up and he said, this is great. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do that. And I remember looking at him and I thought, you know, they're not going to do any of those things. <laughs> and <clears throat> it wasn't me being a skeptic because I'm not, but I had gotten to know this leadership team and I knew that they didn't really trust each other. They didn't follow through. They weren't good at getting the rest of the organization aligned. And I remember sitting there and something deep inside of me saying, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm. Um, I don't want to, this is not how, this is not the work I want to do anymore. Mm. And when I, and that is really out of respect in a funny way, because what I think is most people know what to do. I mean, look mm. at your company, look at your team, look at your company, full yeah. of experts, full yeah. of brilliant experts who have honed their craft and their discipline. Right. And then I realized it was, how do you get people out of their own way? Yeah. And how do you get people in community, in polity, to work together? And I just said, you know, that's what I, I want that. I want to yeah. do that. Wow. And um, and I did it. I, I came back home. I would have maybe done it a little differently because I just closed my marketing business down and uh, started from scratch. 
And I, I have really as a purpose to help people rediscover the joy and the courage in their work. You know, that's mm. what we need at work. We need to be working on things. And I see this in you all the time, uh, Shelley, where you are courageous and you're joyful. I mean, you actually like you like what you're doing. You find it interesting. And so I, I just began asking and listening to mm. people. Asking mm-hmm. this to people. Well, I have a, you can't see it on the camera, but I'm staring at it right now in my home office. I have a plaque, the little thing that you gave me many, probably 10 years ago that says, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Yeah. And um, clearly you have, uh, you, you, you just jumped, which I so admire, but you also have brought team, like you're coaching individuals, but you're coaching teams and organizing. I mean, you're pulling through entire large organizations as you, as you do this. And I think that that sort of gets me to the next question, which is sort of the how, Uh because you're, you often have coached about, you know, we know the work that needs to be done, but it's the method of how to get it done. That's the hardest part. And you have you've really studied the science of this and teams as well. So could you elaborate for us a little bit about that? Yes, I think again, I think that some of this is um, getting to where even when I was talking about political uh, political savvy and um, empathy, a lot of it is you, you know this idea that we think it's all us and it's got to be hard. And we've got to make a lot of assumptions and we have to know everything inside of ourselves. And so I think that one of the things that we're seeing now is that people have to come to terms with some realities. So one of the realities that I think that we all have to come to terms with is that time is finite and our to do list is not. Mm. (laughs) And 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 that that we are wasting a lot of our lives trying to get our inboxes clean yeah and and to just be able to live with the discomfort i think of imperfection right that we're not going to get it all done and so the question is then what will i do what will i do and so as you well know we talk all the time about impact yeah impact and we're 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 and you're right. I love the science because I work with a lot of uh, technical people and engineers and geophysicists and uh, you know Microsoft, of course, is filled with you know brilliant uh, coders and 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 so they are a little bit more about exactitude. And so one of the things that has been just riveting to me has been uh, the work that I did for three years with some um, neuroscientists from Yale, where we're really beginning to understand sort of this machine that's between our two ears. And we have coming out of centuries of the industrial age, we are expert at how machines run. And now it's time for us to understand this machine. Now we're just really at the infancy stages of it. We don't know a lot, but we know enough to know that that we've got lots of chemicals stirring around in this brain and that we've got some control over which ones are. You know, we know what we have. If we respond a certain way, we sort of open the bottle of cortisol, which some of that is okay, but too much of that uh, we know now uh, limits what we see, limits what we hear, makes us sick. And we also know how do you connect with somebody, you know, when you don't know everything and you're in self-discovery and joint discovery. And so um, I think unlocking, first of all, that we have, that we are the instrument. Mm -hmm. We are the instrument. And how do we take care of this instrument? How do we um, develop this instrument? How do we show our fondness and respect to this instrument? And so it's this idea, it doesn't have anything to do with not working hard or stretch assignments, but it's it's like putting some sort of reality and grace into the um, into the equation. So I have X number of minutes today. What's my best use of them for the larger good? 
And and when you people always know the answer to that. Yeah. You know, whenever I work with teams and they're drowning and work and work and I'll say, well, what are you doing that's most important? Nobody ever says uh, uh, jeepers. I have no idea. Right. People always know what is the most important thing that they were doing. And so let's let's do that. So I think impact is one recognizing our um, recognizing our um, our own personal limits. And the other is recognizing that what what our whole life was called cheating, like looking on somebody else's paper or today is smart. Right. Who can you ask for help? Where can you accelerate? Um, where can you um, sort of beg, borrow, and steal? You know, to to get move things across. Where can you share? What you know, sort of just like, just like to keep keep the um, the river flowing. So yeah. I think that's really the piece. And and to be, to be able to say I'm doing my best. I mean, what is more important than doing your best? I mean. Why do we think we have to do something more than our best? Yeah. You, you know, I mean, like, that's, that's like, that's, that's the top of the rung. Yeah. Is doing our best. Right. Right. And it's not all about effort. It's all, so I'm doing my best to be healthier. I'm doing my best to find some work-life balance. I'm doing my best to upskill myself and the people that work with me, you know. And um, I think that that I think sort of re reframing how we hold work. I'm so disheartened that the way that we're thinking about post-COVID you know, we've done this exercise with your team about what did you learn from COVID and what, you know, what, who are you after COVID? And I've been doing that around the world. It's really, really interesting. The first thing people say is exactly what your team said is, I haven't thought about it. Right. Such a great question. I haven't thought about it. I mean, we've had this cataclysmic shared experience and we couldn't wait to get out of it. Well, Eva, I mean, I think present company starting here um i think everybody who has is listening to this is going to really regret the fact that you are going into <laughs> retirement I'm, uh, not, I think, I'm not retiring <laughs> okay okay you're gonna get a lot of you're gonna get a lot of um at mentions i think on linkedin it's just been a fascinating conversation i've been taking notes of my own and i think the the time is finite, but our to-do list is not is you know just such an unbelievable place to close so thank you I have we we were closing these out with sort of five fun five questions just to see <laughs> another side of you. And so I'm gonna okay. go through them real quick and we'll be fun to hear what your thoughts are. So first okay. of all, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Oh my gosh. Um well let me tell you this that um several years ago, uh, my family and I went to Uganda, Africa, and when when we signed up for our shots. You had to sign up. Do you want to be an adventure eater or not? Yeah. So, and we and we took the adventure shot. Okay. So I think I ate some things in Africa that I don't even know what they were, but <laughs> I, I they're so weird you don't even know the name. Okay. Yeah. Who's your favorite superhero? I have to say Wonder Woman. Yeah. Right. It's funny. I so many people there. Me too. Living yeah. Her. Who didn't yeah. want to be her? Best invention ever. Best invention. Now, this is going to sound pretty um, low tech, but I have to say the electric toothbrush. Oh. I cannot believe that something that we have to do at least twice a day that's sort of boring has been made easier for us with the electric. <laughs> I'm like a connoisseur of sorts, you know, like <laughs> if they have the water floss and, and I just bought a new one that has three brushes so it goes in the back and the top and the front and even oh you've got the fancy version yes yeah. <laughs> it's going to be reminding you go to the dentist soon yes okay yeah. um if you could be a fly on the wall who would you want to listen to oh boy i think it would have to be just because i also have a degree in political science i think it would have to be in the situation room of uh -huh. really any president i am just so curious about 
what really goes on there. Well, I would like to have you in those situation rooms. What would you, are you, what's your dream job? Or are you doing it already? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You know, I think, you know, it's interesting. And I'll just end with this. I think most of us are doing our dream jobs because I, one of the things I ask clients to do is remember how much you wanted the job that you're in. Remember how yeah. much you wanted it. And sometimes I'll even say, imagine you have a job where you do do this, 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 and I'll describe the job they want. And they say, that's what they want. Wow. Well, what you not doing is the scaffolding, right? right. And thing that's true for me. So how can I do this work? So not feeling overburdened? How can I do, do this work so that I feel like I really have time for the clients I'm working with? So I think it's always the scaffolding around right. how to do the work and keep experimenting with that. Wow. Well, all of us need to keep doing our dream jobs. And Eva, just a huge thank you to you for joining us today. Great stories. I, I know uh, we wish we had more time, but just so many important lessons that we all got um, a, a free executive coaching session in this Taking Stock Live. And I thank would never you. want to, I wouldn't, um, I can't think of anybody I'd rather have a good conversation with than you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Sally. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For all of you out there, thank you for tuning in. As always, we love your questions. We love your comments. I'm sure you're going to have a lot to say after this amazing conversation. So thank you to all of you in our Taking Stock Live audience. Take care. Mm -hmm.